Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to my podcast on the respiratory system. Function of the respiratory system is basically to take in oxygen and then get rid of carbon dioxide. And right here uh, in Montana at around 5,000 feet, that's no big deal. But if I were to climb Mount Everest, the higher I go, the less oxygen there's going to be. And that's a real limit to uh, our ability to climb very high. And so it wasn't until 1953 that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay finally climbed Mount Everest for the first time. And you can see Tenzing Norgay right up on top, the first photo ever taken from the top of Mount Everest. It wasn't until 1953, but if you can't see on his back, there's a huge canister that contains oxygen and that leads into his mouth because they had to take oxygen with them. And so it wasn't until I think 1971 that somebody was able to climb all the way up Everest without using oxygen. And that they do that by going up to a base camp, move up higher, move down, move higher, move down, move higher, move down. And so their body's starting to accommodate to that change in the uh, elevation. And even that, you're pretty much dying at the top uh, because of that lack of oxygen. And so basically, Animals have figured this out in a number of different ways. If you're a worm, your respiratory surface is actually going to be your skin. You're absorbing oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide through your skin. So their skin has to be moist and they have to have a large surface area. If you're an insect, you use things called spiracles. So basically there are holes on the side of an insect that go to tubes, that go to more tubes and more tubes and more tubes and more tubes. And an insect actually has tubes that almost go all the way down to the level of um, cells. And so you have to have a huge surface area is one thing you need, and then it has to be moist is another thing you need. And so the two big things I want to talk about are gills. So gills is a way that um, fish has, have solved this problem. Uh, and then lungs, and that's the way that we've solved it. And so what's the difference between fish and us? Well, fish live in an area that's really, really moist, so they don't have to worry about that. And so their gills just sit right out in the water. But they also live in an area where there's not much oxygen at all. And so they have to have a very efficient way of exchanging oxygen. Us, well, we have to fold our lungs inside our body so we can keep them moist. Um, but there's so much oxygen in the air relative to the amount that's in the water that we don't have to be as efficient. So how efficient do the gills actually have to be in fish? They can reclaim something like 80% of the oxygen that's in the water. So they're really, really efficient. We're not even close to that. And the way they do that is they use something called countercurrent gas exchange. And so basically, as the blood flows through the gills, the blood is going to flow like this. So all the blood is going to flow in this direction and then it's gonna flow out the other direction. So in the gills, it's going in that direction, and then it comes out in the other direction, but the water is gonna flow in this direction. And so what you have is the blood flowing in this direction, and then you have the water flowing counter to that. And so as they go like that, it pulls water in over their gills, but the blood is moving in opposition to that. Engineers use countercurrent exchange quite a bit, but basically what is it doing? Well, if you think about this, this is going to be the dirtiest of blood down here, and then it's going to get cleaner and cleaner. In other words, it's going to get more and more oxygen. But what it's doing is as it gets more and more oxygen, it's meeting water that's more and more fresh, or in other words, it has more of the oxygen present. And so by putting blood in the opposite direction, they're really efficient at, at, at getting that oxygen outside of the um, water. Now us, we don't have that problem. We do have a problem with moisture, and so we actually have to fold our gills inside our body. They're not gills, but we fold our lungs inside our body. And so we have a trachea that leads down into bronchus and then bronchioles all the way down into the alveoli. One thing that's important to note is that it goes in and then that's it. In other words, it's one-way flow. When we breathe in, it goes in and then that's the end of it. And so if you take things in, like if you smoke, all the material that comes in is going to go into your lungs and then there's no out. And so if you breathe a lot of coal dust, it's going to go in and then it gets stuck in there. Or asbestos goes in and gets stuck. And so the lining of the trachea, lining of our respiratory system has these cilia on them. And so basically what happens is those little hairs are going to move material out of your body so you can cough it up and eventually swallow it. Another cool thing about this is that it really looks, let's even go to this level, it almost looks like a tree. 
upside down. And so basically what's happening is that we are increasing the surface area by having the trachea go to the bronchus and then the bronchioles and then they just keep branching and branching and branching. Again, why are they doing that? They're doing that to increase the surface area. And so your lungs are small, but I remember once reading that they have the surface area of a tennis court. And so by having that large surface area, we can absorb even more oxygen. But the functional units of the lungs are the alveoli. So if we get way to the end of these tiny bronchioles, we eventually have these little sacs. They're called alveoli. They're, they're covered in a single layer of cells called skim, simple squamous cells. And they have a tendency to just kind of fold in. Imagine a tiny balloon that that's that small, it would just kind of fold in on itself. And so they have to have these chemicals called surfactants on the inside that kind of lubricate it so it doesn't close up. That's one of the reasons why in, uh, premature babies have to be in a ventilator because they haven't really developed that surfactant yet. But wrapped around all the alveoli are we have these capillaries. And so basically what's happening is that we're taking oxygen from the... Um, from the alveoli and we're passing that off onto these capillaries and then we're getting rid of carbon dioxide. That's the function of the alveoli. Now how does breathing occur? Um, breathing occurs using the diaphragm muscle. You've dealt with the diaphragm if you've ever had the hiccups because that's just a spasm in the diaphragm muscle. But basically what happens is we have the diaphragm muscle here and then as that contracts and pulls down, then we have air moving in. So it's like you had a jar with a balloon on the inside of it with rubber on this side. And if I were to pull right here, if I were to pull that down, basically it's going to inflate the balloon because air is going to move in through here. So I decrease the pressure. And then as I relax the diaphragm, it's going to go like that. And as I contract the diaphragm, it's going to move up like that. It's very important that then, just like this jar, that this is very intact here. We have to make sure that this whole thoracic cavity is intact so we can create that pressure. Okay, so let's get to the level of that oxygen exchange. So how do we get oxygen in? Well, basically, if you were to look here in the capillaries, let's see, imagine that this out here is the space in the alveoli. So now we have air coming in, so we have air out here. Basically what's gonna happen is these red blood cells, as they move through the capillaries, that oxygen that's inside the uh, alveoli is gonna move in. And so these red blood cells are almost in direct contact with the capillaries. Now where is the oxygen gonna be stored? We have a chemical called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein, and that's stock full inside of all of our uh, red blood cells. That's why it's red. So basically, inside the hemoglobin, we have these iron molecules, one there, one there, one there, one there, and that iron is gonna bond to the oxygen that's found inside the air. And so why is it red? It's because it literally is rusting. The oxygen is attaching to the iron and it's giving us that red color. And so that's where the oxygen is gonna bind. It's gonna bind to that heme group or the iron inside the hemoglobin. What about the carbon dioxide? Well, the carbon dioxide is not really contained within the red blood cell itself. Basically what it's doing is it's being converted to bicarbonate. So we're converting that carbon dioxide with water to this bicarbonate. And a lot of that bicarbonate will actually be right here inside the plasma of the blood. Some of it will be in the blood cell, but most of it's in the plasma. When we get here to the alveoli, we've got enzymes that control all of this, then that's gonna release as carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide goes back into the alveoli, then we breathe that out. We take in more oxygen over and over and over again. And so that's the respiratory system. It doesn't work if we don't have the circulatory system, but we'll get to that in the next podcast, and I hope that was helpful.